Welcome to this recording of the August 27th Saturday morning virtual event of the NMRA PCR Coast Division. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the uh, August 27th meeting of the NMRA Coast Division. I um, wanted to real quickly cover a, a few topics before we get to an exciting clinic today that Dennis Drury is going to do about Raspberry Pi and JMRI. So I'm um, talking a little bit about our um, our clinic, our trip that we did last weekend, talk about September 25th and uh, a couple other little topics as we go through this. Uh, so we had a pretty exciting trip. I think we had about almost 30 people come. Um, we did this last uh, last Sunday, uh, August 21st. Um, we started off at the uh, Golden State Model Railroad Museum. Um, thanks to David for helping set that up with Larry and the folks up there. Um, that was followed by five open layouts, and I think everyone had a had a fun time. Any, are there any kind of comments from anyone about um, you know the uh, last weekend? Any comments or up uh, any uh, things that? Um, we should think about for the future. I know some of the folks here were there at the event, so worthwhile? Very, Very worthwhile. much. You did good. I'm uh, totally pleased. No, I didn't do good. David and every all the layout owners were great. So but well, super. Yeah, it was a I think it was really good. And I think it really showed us that it's, we can do that kind of thing again. And we're planning to try to do those. I, I think the goal that we're going to try, try to set is to do those alternating between our regular quarterly meetings um, in between them do one of these kind of events. Um, so that brings us to our next event. Um, we are going to be September 25th at the South Bay Railroad Historical Society that's in Santa Clara at the depot. Um, we will have two clinic rooms there in the morning. Um, uh, the plan is we'll start about 930. Um, we'll have two clinics at 10 and 11. Um, two have four clinics at 10 and 11, two clinic rooms. Um, we chose a place called the Mission City Grill um, to have for a suggested place for lunch. Um, I'll go ahead and contact them and see if we can get some tables together and something. But that's currently the plan. Um, currently, the plan is to have layout open houses from one to six. Um, that may change. Um, I did get a request from one of the uh, layout owners to say, can I be open until six? I think I may ping the layout owners, ask if they want to be open later. And if they do, especially some of the farther away ones uh, may do that to let people get to them. Um, so this is kind of the, uh, the these are the four clinics we have. Earl has some new scenery techniques um, and uh, he's going to be talking about those. And, you know, of course, we all pay attention because he's gotten his MMR and we have seen the amazing modeling he does. He, he's also going to reprise and a little bit more detail, a discussion about the uh, National Convention and what he saw there when he was at the National Convention. Um, we're going to have a separate clinic, This and this may be a little limited in number of participation. Um, with David <coughs> Gibbons, he's going to do a hands-on soldering clinic. Um, David's um, volunteered to put together uh, multiple soldering stations so that people actually have a chance to... Uh, do some actual soldering and get some instruction on it. And, you know, David's a almost professional solder, I guess is the right word. So that's a great opportunity to uh, improve your soldering and your techniques. Um, Dave Adams is going to do a scratch building uh, clinic, one of the clinics he's done at the National Narrow Gauge Conventions. Um, and then finally, Fran Foley is going to do an introduction to Tinkercad. Uh, I think that'll be a, is, is pretty exciting. I mean, Tinkercad, is such an excellent program for modelers for um, the kind of things we do and the way it works. So I, I've used FreeCAD and I've actually, I'm very interested in listening to Fran because I'm thinking about switching the CAD program I use over to Tinkercad. So I just think it's easier. It looks like, it looks to me like it's easier to use and more functional for the kinds of things I do with it. Um, these are the open layouts we have planned. Um, probably more layouts than we need, quite frankly. <laughs> um, it's going to be a bit of a battle to get to all of them. Um, but, you know, I think that one of the things I found was after two years of COVID and not having had a lot of layout tours in the Coast Division for a while, um, everyone's pretty excited about having their layouts open. So um, even Dave Loveless, who's in Watsonville, um, I talked to him about the fact that at some point we're going to try to do one of the field trips we've been doing down over the hill 
you know, in the Monterey Santa Cruz area. But he wanted to have his layout open. So, you know, if someone wants to make a trip down at the end of the day, down that away, um, that'll be a, a good trip. It's about 50 minutes to get down to Watsonville. Um, so some great layouts, um, some of them you know. Um, but if, what I was going to do was go ahead and share. Uh, this is up on the web. Um, and if you look in the chat, there's a tiny URL that will open this for you. Um, so you just click on that tiny URL. Um, this, that URL will stay the same. Um, if you notice, this was updated this morning. We had one change. Um, and it basically has all the information about what's going to happen, the schedule for the day, um, the clinics with a little bit more description than you saw there, the layout locations you saw, and then has the a little bit about each of the layouts that are open. So, you know, this is a, a great place for you to go in and, you know, see each of the layouts and decide which ones you want to go see. So overall, I think that's going to be a, a pretty exciting um, an exciting event. Are you guys seeing, are you guys seeing still the slides? Yes, I, think I, I think I need to stop my share. I apologize for that. I sat here and did what I tell everybody not to do and I shared the wrong screen. So here is actually, this is what's up on the web. Um, so if you click on that link, you'll get this. And it's kind of a complete lay, complete list of what's in the, um, going to happen on that on that Sunday the schedule um, the clinics in detail um, where the layouts will be um, what we'll have is a handout like we did on the 21st um, we'll have handouts and we'll also have a um, a UR we'll also have an online link for a layout uh, tour map etc and locations you know, the link isn't live on my screen but is that are you sending this out to us as an email? Um, and the, actually, if you go in the chat, the link is in the chat. And if you go in the chat, you'll find it in the oh, chat. Oh, it's in it, chat. Okay, thank yeah, it you. Was, it was in chat. It's in chat here, and it's in the Ghost Extra as well. Uh, I, I don't see it in chat. Yeah, I don't either. Aha. Uh -huh. I will put it in right after I start talking. When, when, when I get done here and Dennis starts talking, I'll put it in chat. So give me a, and Phil, give it a and couple Phil, of minutes. Looking at most of your background, your, your slide is just a, a small window in your background. Huh. Hang on. That's weird. So you should be seeing. I don't see it. No, we just see a small window. We see oh, your, hang on! Hang your on. desktop with the small window. Yeah, I'm I'm screwing up here. I I yeah. showed you the wrong screen. Okay, so I'm going to do this again. I'm going to have to edit this all out of the video. Um, so this is this is the link to what's up on the web. Um, and this is basically our uh, the flyer. And what we're going to pretty much do for events is do this kind of a flyer. It'll get changed. Um, it just got changed this morning. There's an updated note at the top, but the link will stay live. Um, so it has uh, information on the schedule, information on the clinics, uh, and then it has information on the open layout locations. And like I said, we'll pass out a um, we'll pass out pass out a little flyer with addresses at the meet. Um, and for folks who can't come to the clinics in the morning. I know doing this on Sunday is sometimes a challenge for folks. Um, turns out the South Bay uh, RHS um, asked us to use a Sunday. So um, some folks I know won't be able to make it there in the morning because of commitments like church, et cetera. If that's the case, contact me and I'll provide the, the addresses for the layouts for the afternoon to members. Um, and then we have a little bit of uh, information about all the layouts, the club layouts, as well as the open member layouts. Um, so I didn't make this up as slides, so just everyone can see it that way. Um, so I think that's that's essentially what we're planning on doing. Lots of layouts, lots of, of interesting opportunities. Um, one thing we still do, do need is we need uh, additional volunteers. Um, one thing that really needs some help with um, is finding a venue for the December auction. Um, turns out the Elks do not have any dates for December. Um, we're looking into potentially the adult center or the, um, the senior center in Alameda. 
I'm actually looking at doing something in Los Altos at their community center. But if someone has a location and can check into it a little bit, give me a call or and we'll figure out if that's the right place to, to go to do the event. Um, so with that, I'm going to throw it right now over to uh, Dennis Drury. And Dennis, I lost an N in your, your uh, dentist there. And Dennis is going to talk to us about Raspberry Pi and JMRI, which to me is pretty exciting because uh, Raspberry Pi is a great way to do JMRI either for a layout or on a workbench. So with that, Dennis, I'll throw it to you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Phil. Let me see if I can bring this up. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we're yes. Good. Screen? Yes, no, maybe? Yes. Okay. Hold on. I need to do one more thing. Okay. Oh. Well, this is great. I can start the slideshow, but then I can't share my screen anymore. So let's start my video. Okay, well, I can still do it this way. Um, okay, so we can see all this. Um, this is a clinic that I gave at the Return to the Redwoods convention earlier this year. And um, it's basically how to set up JMRI on a Raspberry Pi. And a Raspberry Pi is a um, standalone microcomputer, uh, very cheap, um, easy to use. And um, the slide is out of date. I don't think it's $35 anymore. I think it's a bit more than that. But um, let's see. Okay, so what is JMRI? I don't know if everybody in the Silicon Valley knows this, but um, I'm sure you do. JMRI is the Java Model Railroad Interface. It's a suite of applications running in a single program, which includes Decoder Pro, Panel Pro, Operations Pro. Um, you can interface cell phones and tablets so they can be used as throttles and other things. Uh, many other features, too numerous to mention here. And it is open source and free to download and use, although donations are encouraged. So what is a Raspberry Pi? A Raspberry Pi is an inexpensive, fully functional microcomputer that can be set up and configured to run JMRI. So you don't need a full-blown computer, an expensive laptop, or anything else. Uh, the Raspberry Pi will support multiple devices. Uh, <coughs> You can interface a keyboard, two monitors, a mouse, and um, other hardware to interface to your layout. Um, then where can you buy a Raspberry Pi? Well, where can you buy anything these days? At Amazon. So this is where I got mine. Um, this is the Amazon window for a Raspberry Pi starter kit. And this says $119.99. The price has gone up like everything else. I looked this morning, it's 139 um, and they are in stock, so you can get them. I like this because it comes with everything you need. It comes with the case, the SD card, the SD card reader, a fan, a power supply, cabling, and pretty much everything you need to get started. The only thing you would need to add is a monitor and a keyboard mouse. And any questions in the meantime, feel free to jump in. This is my Raspberry Pi JMRI setup for my railroad. Um, I have developed a CTC panel based on a USNS CTC system. Um, and you can see I have staging on the lower level staging, upper level staging, um, three sidings in the middle, some industries. There's a yard in here. Um, But the important thing is, this is the Raspberry Pi right here. This is a Digitrax UT4 throttle for a size comparison. I have a Sprog connected to the Raspberry Pi, which I use to program my decoders with Decoder Pro. I also have a PR3 to connect into my Digitrax system to monitor the LocoNet. 
And it's not visible in this picture, but there is also a CMRI interface, which I'll get to in a second. So that deals with the hardware. Now what about software? Um, part of the beginning of this clinic, I said, you don't need to be a software guru to know how to set this up. And here's why. I don't know how easy this is to read, but there is a gentleman out in the world called Steve Todd um, who has written the software for the Raspberry Pi. Um, it includes the setup for the Raspberry Pi. It includes JMRI. It includes, basically you download his um, file, you copy it over to the SD card, you put it in the Raspberry Pi, boot it up and it works. It's just pretty much that simple. Um, it's hard to read, but um, if anybody needs it, they can email me. My email address is at the end of the presentation and I can send you the link um, for, for Steve Todd's website. So when you get the program loaded on the SD card and you turn on your Raspberry Pi, this is what you get. You get uh, the JMRI start screen, you get Panel Pro and it automatically defaults into Panel Pro. And I'll point out that from Panel Pro, you can also bring up your roster and your locomotives and do your programming that way. Um, so it comes up and it opens up, in my case, four windows, the regular Panel Pro window. It opens up my file for my railroad, the Klamath Falls subdivision. Loconet over TCP, which I don't really use, but it opens it up anyway. And the Weed Throttle window here, which I'll get to in a second. Next thing that's important to know is if you um, pull the USB ports right here when you're setting up, this is kind of important and I know it's hard to read, but this is all of the ports that the Raspberry Pi has. And as I said, I have three connections to each one. Well, as an example, if you plug in your CMRI node, you'll see one of these ports activate. And if you unplug it, you'll see it deactivate. And that tells you that this um, port right here is the one to show that. Dennis? This is my, yes. Just let here. you know uh, if, you, uh, if you can see chat, some questions are coming up for you there, sir. Ah, okay, yeah, I see five, so. Um, Okay, the low. Ken Adams. Looking for the Coast Flyer. Um, I try to show my screens as a full screen. If I started it on my computer, then I couldn't do the share screen. So, um, oh, and somebody put the Todd link up. That's good, thank you. Go ahead, um, try, putting, tr try putting a slideshow right now, Dennis. Throw it in the slideshow. Go up where it says slideshow, up at the top. Okay, yeah, I'm working on it. Let's see, slideshow. Hey, yeah. there you go. What do you know? Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, let me go back to the previous screen for a second. So here's my USB ports. You can see them listed here. Um, so the next screen, this is my CMRI configuration. And you can see the serial port is the TTY USB zero. And the reason I knew that is that as I unplug the, the connection to the CMRI, this TTY USB zero would go away. Then when I plug it back in, it would come back. And that's how you're able to determine which port is used for which hardware configuration. So this is my CMRI connection. Again, I have a Loconet through PR3. I have a Sprog programmer. All of these have a USB port for the CM, for the uh, Raspberry Pi. This is my CTC screen for my railroad. Um, this is running on a simulator basis right now. I pulled this off my computer, but um, lower level staging with the selections for the in and out. Um, Klamath Falls crossover, here's the main yard and the Klamath Falls siding with the depot working its way up. This is the climb to the second, third level actually, uh, third level and on into upper level staging. As of right now, the railroad is only built to right here, but I've got the panel ready to go for when I uh, finish this all up. This is my CMRI connection. This um, dongle here, this cable goes back to the Raspberry Pi. 
<coughs> excuse me. And then it talks to the, what I'm using the CP node from Seth Newman's company. Um, I have a node here. I've got three others. Is that right? One, two, four others at this point in time. And the CMRI talks to each node in turn. Um, Seth's company has uh, model road control systems, has really good documentation on how to set up the individual nodes. Um, that all of that documentation is downloaded from his website. If somebody wants to put model railroad control systems.com into the chat, that would be great. But again, setting up the, uh, setting up these nodes, you have to set up the uh, configuration for each node. You have to configure it in JMRI and you have to configure it in the board itself. So this is configuring the board itself. Basically you set an individual address for the board, the speed it's gonna to talk to the system. And um, these are extender boards that are available. So let's see, one is input. So I have one, two, three, four inputs and one, two, three, four outputs. And these I'm not using because it says not assigned. Uh, more chat, let's see. Ah, thanks for that. Okay. Why didn't it go down? Ah, here we go. So again, this is from Seth's documentation. Um, the master host computer, this is the Raspberry Pi. You need the RS-485 card, which is this device right here. And then you go into the first CP node, which is what I'm using. The S-Mini and the SUSIC are both left over from uh, Bruce Chubb's original CMRI system. But you feed in in a serial mode from node to node to node. And like I say, I have four, so I have one more over here that I have set up. You have to, in JMRI itself, you have to set up the uh, CP nodes. Again, this is from my railroad, so node 11, node 12, node 13. And then I've, I also have a node 10 in here, which is not on this um, slideshow. I set it up as CP node, the node address. Um, this is pretty much you don't need to worry about. And these are for the extender cards, the extender boards that Seth offers. Once you have that configured, you click on update node, it goes into here. And here you can see node 11 has 32 input bits, 24 outputs. And the, the bits are basically to re-track occupancy detection, turnout position, the output bits are to send a signal to throw the turnouts and to set the signals um, for the correct aspect. Hang on, I'm gonna mute for a second, maybe. Excuse me. Um, once everything is set up, you wanna check and you can pull the CMRI system. That's a selection in Panel Pro. Here you can see that Polling 11, receiving 11. Polling 12, receiving 12. Polling 13, receiving 13. And it just repeats over and over again. Um, as things change on the railroad, these values here will change. So that's not really important. This is just a check to see that it's actually working the way you expect it to. So what else can JMRI do? I'm sure everybody knows most of this, but um, yeah, how much time do we have? Um, Dakota Pro, these are the locomotives I currently have on my railroad with um, the Dakota models, the road name, road number, manufacturer model, and everything else. This was all done through the Sprog uh, to program these up. And they are, I think pretty much every one of these is on the Res Pro. These are the trains that once my road is complete, I will be running, but I can also set this up as a simulator to verify traffic patterns and to make sure that the trains uh, run as expected. I have done this in simulator mode several times and it seems like it's gonna work. And I th think that's it. So questions. So is everybody awake? 
I, I have a question, sir. Sure. So my wife has a little laptop, right? What advantage of, instead of using that, what advantage does using the um, little Raspberry Pi have over just taking some leftover computer or laptop? Um, that is one option. Some people do have leftover computers or laptop or alternative than using your regular computer. At one point, I had my regular laptop configured to the railroad, and I thought, yeah, I have to keep taking it other places. And I just thought, mm. when I, for 119 bucks, I can just buy this. It's already installed. It's already in place, and it's ready to go. So, again, it's not necessary, but it's if you don't want to use a regular computer or dedicate one to the layout, then this is one way to go. Right. I have noted that her little laptop is a Windows machine, and and keeping the stupid thing updated is a nightmare. How often do you have to, how often do you have to update your Raspberry Pi to keep um, up with whatever? Sure. Well, first off, my Raspberry Pi is not connected to the outside internet, so it's only its own little local network. I I don't have a a network connection to the World Wide Web for it, so it doesn't automatically update. Uh, I have not updated it since I installed it. The only thing, reason I could think of to update it is if um, right now that Pi is running JMRI version um, 4.20, and if I wanted to go to 4.26 or 5. whatever the latest version is, I would basically just go to Steve Todd's website, download another image, and reload it. It's pretty much that simple. Um, I don't know if anybody can see this. This is... Um, See if I can put it up here where you can see it. This is my railroad on a Samsung tablet, which is connected to the Raspberry Pi. I can throw switches from this tablet. It's basically if I was sitting in front of the Raspberry Pi computer as well. I also have engine driver on here, which um, that is one of my locomotives. It's set up if I just start <clears throat> increasing the speed, it'll start moving. So I'm not going to do that. Um, I have <laughs> my iPhone 6 uh, connected to the um, Pi if I want to use it for throttle. Um, I usually don't because I have enough throttles for myself, but if other people want to come over and they bring a phone or a tablet, um, it takes two minutes to connect them up and they're ready to go and they can start running trains. Is the, wi is the Raspberry Pi providing a wireless connection? Yeah, it comes with it. Oh, and okay. Steve Todd's image turns it on at, when JMRI boots up. Okay. Yeah, so we actually, in, in Pleasanton at the club, in Pleasanton on the O-Scale Railroad, we put a, JR, a Raspberry Pi in under the railroad to run JMRI just to have a wireless connection um, for, the, uh, for, the rail, for basically control. Yeah. And, and it turns and out... Pretty, pretty inexpensive. If you don't have to buy the full starter kit, um, you know, I think they're now they're about forty-five to fifty dollars to buy a Raspberry Pi and put it in. Right, and then you need the power supply and all yep. the other. So I just bought the kit. It was easier just that way. Stuff. Yep. Right. Um, the other thing I would will point out is I ran into a problem with my uh, engine driver and we throttles a while back, and it turns out that when the Apple updates the iOS on the uh, iPhone, it can sometimes require you to reinstall the Wii throttle and the same with engine drivers. So <coughs> if it's not working, that's the first thing to check is the tablet or the phone. Is there a uh, minimum version uh, of uh, uh, Raspberry Pi required? Can you use a, an old three or uh, old B? I had before I bought the four. I had this same setup running on a Raspberry Pi 2, and it worked just fine. Great. So if you can find one of those, and they're probably cheaper, um, that will also work. JMRI doesn't take a lot of horsepower, if you will, so you can you don't need a lot of RAM. You uh, don't need, I think the uh, you need at least an eight gigabyte um, SD card, but um, you know. It just it just seems to work. I still have the Raspberry Pi 2 in case I ever need to. Uh, a spare, but uh, it, it's working just fine. Can I get 
So um, and unless you're short of time. I'm uh, not short of time. David or Phil, or, and and uh, I, I might have missed uh, like it was a, a like a block diagram between the pie and the hardware that Seth makes and the actual turnout motors, sprog and all that. Was there, was there a block diagram for that? Yeah, let me, let me start sharing a grin and, and we'll go back to that. Okay, so let me back up, hopefully. Oops, there. Okay, that was part of it. Okay, so let me put my glasses back on so I can see. So this is the um, RS-45 interface right here to the Pi to the first CP node. And this is the first one. Here's the second one going out. Um, here's a tortoise. This is staging, so I didn't feel the need to put my tortoises underneath. They're just mounted right next to the turnout they control. This board here is um, also from Seth's company, it's called an RSMC remote stall motor controller. These wires go back. Um, two of them are, are power, you know, plus 12 and ground. And then the green wire goes back underneath here to one of these pins. So when I select a route through the Raspberry Pi, if this turnout is part of that route, this bit will throw and it will turn out themselves. And, and this is a basic block diagram. This master host computer is the Raspberry Pi. The USB 485 card, that was that um, little blue box I showed you. There's really each one of these is a pair. So four wires going to the first CP node, which was in the picture I just showed you. And then coming out, there were a cable coming out and going to the next node, which is about 15 feet away. And then it comes out and it comes, the last one is um, out here. Um, it's actually in a temporary position until I get the, uh, the loop up to the third level put in where it's gonna live underneath that. Is that clear? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Dennis, Dennis, I think the thing that's important is that 485 buzz, you know, it's basically- so anything else? The, Dennis, just a, the comment, the 485 bus is a daisy chain. So it, it goes from one node to the next and it's a pulled bus. And it's the same whether you're using Seth's products. Physically, it's the same interface as whether you're using Seth's products or the original CMRI stuff from Chubb. That is correct. That's why, um, and again, this is Seth's documentation. So the S mini and the SUSIC are here because you can still use the old hardware. Right. That's great. So and, I, and you need a, a similar card from USB. For example, if you want to go to an NCE um, to an NCE system on your um, DCC. You need a similar serial converter that goes to that connection. So it's a different kind of connector, but it is the same thing. Right. From and, USB. Um, so like I said, um, here's the Pi. And this cable here, the white one goes to the Sprog, which then connects up to the programming track. Yep. Um, this silver connector is the one that goes over to the RS-485 connection to the uh, CMRI system. And then one of these ones underneath, uh, I think it's this gray one loops around and connects into the PR3 to uh, interface with my Digitrack system. And, oh, oops, I went too far. Like I said, here's the local net connection and the Sprog pro programmer connection. And the advantage of Steve, Todd, Steve Todd's um, image is you download it, you write it to the SD card, you put the SD card in the Pi, you apply power and it just boots up into JMRI and off you go. Yeah, I think that's an important point, Dennis, to make is that programming and using a Raspberry Pi is a little different than a traditional computer where you're actually doing all the work on the computer. You basically develop an image on a computer 
put it on a micro SD card, plug it into the Raspberry Pi and run the Raspberry Pi, and then it has the image. Right. So you're, and, you're actually using the, almost the Raspberry Pi as a, not as a computer, but as a control node, so to speak, that's got, a, got all the programs built into it that it needs. Yeah, it's called a microcontroller. Um, and again, the only programming knowledge you need is JMRI itself. You don't need to know any Linux or Unix or um, any of that, unless you want to dig into it. I mean, you could. But again, you, you put the image on the SD card, you plug it in, you turn it on, and this is, oops, it boots to here. From here, you can get into Panel Pro, um, and like I said, once you get into Panel Pro, you can go anywhere. And Dennis, whose card was uh, whose card um, card was that? The uh, um, whose, whose image was that? That's Steve Todd's, and uh, Steve. that link is in the chat. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think the other question that was asked about the level of Raspberry Pi, you know, one of the things I think is cool about this is you can use it as a programming station on your workbench really easily and have a track built into your workbench where you can program, have the Raspberry Pi there, maybe have an old small monitor there and keyboard to work with or something like that. And for that, I think you probably could use one of the older Raspberry Pis pretty easily. You can. If all you're, if all you're doing is, you're not running Panel Pro, which is I think more application intense than just running the, the programmer, the DCC programmer panel. Mm -hmm. Right, but what I'm, what I'm saying is this is my, workstation if you will um so off to the side here well, there's the sprog and the programming track is right over here um next to staging so and, and as, as i said this did all run on a raspberry pi 2 um the one thing i will point out is that steve todd's image does not include a link to decoder pro but if you just click on Panel Pro, you can then get to your roster. That's that's not a problem. And the other thing I'll point out is that I do, let's see, let me go back. Oh, no, I'm gonna go forward, sorry. So this Panel Pro panel, my CTC system, was developed on my, I drew it on my laptop in a simulator mode. And then when I'm ready, I just copy the file to a USB card, take it to the Raspberry Pi and uh, put it into this folder right here where it says open JMRI user files. Just double click on that, it brings up the user file folder and then I just copy from the USB into that folder and set the system to boot into opening that file and we're all set to go. Hey Dennis, just out of uh, curious, I saw Todd had some had an email for support. Are there any online support groups like on groups.io for this that you know people can use if they start going down this path and need some technical support? Yes, I will say that Steve Todd is on the JMRI users group on Groups.io. Yep. Um, when I had problems with my um, tablet and my phone trying to connect up the engine driver and the Wii throttle, that's where I went. Steve Todd got right back to me and we figured it out within 24 hours. Through the JMRI, sometimes they'll take it offline. Um, but yes, the support is there. <laughs> And like I said, I put my email at the end of the present. That's great, Dennis. Thank, thank so you so much. So people can email me, grammar, but I can try. Thank you, Dennis. That was that was great. Thank you. Any other questions for Dennis? I just put my email in the uh, chat. Ah, super. I was going to do that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
I think it's a great, I, I think the thing about Raspberry Pi is it's a great way to get that control for fairly reasonable cost and not having all the complexity of a laptop or a, a desktop there. And plus it's tiny. And like I said, you know, if your workbench and that is in a separate room, my, my, my well, workbench and, and my layout you, suffer. Sorry. Well, go ahead. Yeah. And, you know, people mentioned a Windows update, you know, I've, I've seen Windows update on a on a laptop or whatever cause it not to talk to the railroad anymore and again because the raspberry pi doesn't do that you are in control of any updates you want to do uh, it's just going to sit there and run whatever program is in there with no updates and, and the the beauty of it is from a control perspective like you said the control panel that you've got there is generated out of panel pro once you built your configuration structure in panel pro that's correct and and i see a question from ken adams um moving to loco fi wi-fi command communication with locomotives with no signals on the track i if we're talking about what's called dead rail i don't know if this is um relevant or not ken i i haven't really gone down that path so i can't say it is but who knows well, I, I think it's important to, to there, there are kind of almost three use cases here that Dennis, you've talked about simultaneously. Um, the first is the programming track, which is kind of a dedicated use of the uh, decoder pro and that to program your locomotives. Um, the second is the ability to control DCC, which is on the layout directly from JMRI which lets you use, you know, the Wi-Fi throttles and that kind of thing. And then the third part of this is the whole thing of doing the CMRI for signaling and turnout control and layout control. And I, th I think even if you're using dead rail, dead rail probably changes the first two, unless you're doing dead rail with the DCC decoders, where you want to use it for, for the programming of the, DC, of the uh, decoders. But if you're using something that doesn't have DCC, that's a separate dead rail system, it still has the advantage of being able to do signaling and turnout control and those kinds of things as a separate way to control the layout. Yeah, that is correct, Phil. And, and um, you know, my prototype is CTC. Um, so since my prototype used it, I have to use it. Um, I based my panel on a uh, prototype panel that controlled uh, the Cascade sub from Eugene to Crescent Lake. And um, so, again, you don't have to use the Pi for programming decoders. You don't have to use it for uh, DCC communication, but you can use it still for signaling and turnout control. You well, thanks, Vincent, Dennis. David. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks. Uh, I, I think it's great, great input, great input, and great way for folks to think about if this is the right way to proceed with some computer integration and control. Um, so, everybody, a round of applause for you, uh, round of applause for Dennis. Thanks. Thank you. And again, remember, it's cheap, and JMRI is free to download. Donations are, are are encouraged. Yeah, you you. I never got an answer to what uh, what programming language is used on on JMRI. Is it Linux or uh, JMRI is Java program program using the Java language, and using Java. So what means code is it written in? Java. It the the program itself is written in Java for JMRI. The Raspberry Pi operating system is Linux. Yeah. But Raspberry Pi, you can also get images that will run Windows 10. I have not used them, but I know they're out there. But and Ken, Raspberry Pi also uses Python. Okay. So, so JMRI is built in Java. That's why it's Java. Is it just, is it basically it's a, a JavaScript Java, it's, app? It's a Java app. It's not JavaScript. Okay. It's Java. Java and JavaScript is a subset. But it's Java running on a Linux, i.e. a Unix computer. Okay. Um, but if you buy a Raspberry Pi and you want to write your own program, 
you can write programs in Python. So, for example, at the club in Pleasanton, we set up a couple of um, basically there are sound stations where you push a button on the wall. And we've got a directed antenna, a directed sound speaker system above. It's kind of a cone speaker system, and it plays a a specific um, sound. It's not a sound file, and that's just done using a Raspberry Pi and Python, where it's a pretty simple Python program. When you push the button, it plays the pro it plays a sound file. Um, and there's actually a button that you can stop the play in that. And that program is written in Python and loaded the same way down into Raspberry Pi. So Jerem okay. is is one way you can use it. The the kind of standard programming language is Python. I really have to go way back to dust off my old Java. <laughs> Ken, just, just as a, as a follow-up, um, JMRI is an acronym for Java Model Railroad Interface. That kind of explains it. Yep. Um, but because it's written in Java, it can run on a Mac, it can run on Windows, and it can run well, on the yeah, Unix well, well, system. Well, 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 uh, a presentation, good idea, right? What was that? I'm, I'm, I'm just listening about railroad presentation from Bakersfield area, from the Fresno area. So anyway, to, to follow up with Ken, um, I if you download the JMRI program from the JMRI, they have the three different operating systems to choose from. And as I said, I've developed my panel on my laptop, which is running Windows 10, and then I can transfer the file over to the Raspberry Pi Does that answer your question, Ken? Yeah, it sort of does. But yeah, I, I'm not really interested in getting into it, but I'm just curious as to, as to what the foundations are. Sure. What's our next item of business, uh, uh, Phil? Excellent. Well, thanks again, Anybody Dennis. And, and I will go ahead and close this off and let Dennis uh, um, either hang out and listen or go do something else. Um, I'm going to go do, oops, I'm going to go do something else. And thanks for having me on. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks guys. Talk to you later. So with that, unless there are any questions, uh, about the September 25th event or other things, um, the only other comment I have, um, just for the group, and this is, uh, we'll talk about this uh, over the next uh, month or so as we have, um, some more meetings. Um, in March, um, there's going to be a great train show in San Mateo. Um, I have a very much personal goal for the division of having us turn that into a recruiting event um, for potential members. So if anyone is interested in participating with figuring out how we do a better job of Hello. conveying the value proposition of being part of the Coast Division at a, real, at a train show, um, give me a call and, and get involved in that. I'm probably going to try to start a little working group on it. Um, we actually have a monitor at Fran's house that, um, that, um, Seth had. And so we're going to have the capability of putting up some videos. Um, I'm going to work with John Abadicola probably to get some of his videos transformed into something we can play about, you know, layouts in the division and that kind of thing. And kind of some things about events and that, but would love to have some folks think about, you know, how do we create a message? I, I'll be really frank. I'm not, I'm a lot less interested in going personally. I'm a lot less interested in going to train shows to have a presence. That's about showing kids how to do modeling. I'm a lot more interested in going and explaining to the 10% of attendees that are actually model rowers in which we probably have only, you know, 10% or 20% or NMRA members what do we say to the 80% of people of model railroaders who come to those events as to why they should become part of the NMRA and part of the coast division. So um, I'd love to have anyone who is interested in participating and kind of putting that together and building a program here. Um, it also says, by the way, we're going to think very closely about what our event looks like probably, probably in April or May. And because of the convention, we're going to have to work around the, the regional convention, the PCR convention. But one of the, the thoughts we've had is um, when there is a train show, 
what we'd like to do is sometime after that three or four weeks have an event with the idea that we can give out, you know, a golden ticket to people at the train show that's an invitation to the event and kind of get an on-ramp to participation. So, um, again, if anyone's interested in participating, just send me an email. I think everybody has my email, so I'll also put it in the chat just in case. Um, so with that, I'll just throw it open. Anybody, any interesting modeling going on? David? Uh, this isn't modeling, but I wanted to let everybody know I've started communicating to Dave Tateosian, president of the Carquinez Model Railroad Society, about a field trip taking us up to Crockett. There is uh, the big eight monstrous HO layout they're running there. Uh, and then on the uh, in the building, the same building, the Crockett Toy Train Operating Museum is uh, there to be seen, and the Bay Area N Track Club is in the Crockett Station. Who they might be interested in doing it. We're trying to work on uh, figuring uh, a date uh, in February, back half of February, 18th or later. So just a heads up that I'm trying to work on that one to get us another field trip, uh, and then Phil is uh, I think scratching his anatomy trying to figure out what uh, layouts we might other layouts we might visit during a field trip in February. Did that come through Phil? <laughs> Hello. Yes, it, yes it did. Okay, yep. good. All right. Everybody's just done. And, and 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 kind of kind of an extension of that from David, you know, one of the things that um, I, I think we found is that having these not meets where we have clinics and that, but this kind of uh, an event where we go visit somebody in the morning and have local layout tours in the afternoon is kind of a great event to have. Um, if someone has relationships um, or, you know, is involved with or has contacts with any railroad organization in the division, um, you know, we, we did Niles Canyon. I'm actually having some conversations with Jack Burgess uh, about Ardenwood. I started some conversations with the guys down in uh, Roaring Camp, um, but very much, you know, interested in anything like that, where there's somewhere where we can go do a morning activity and then have some afternoon layout tours. I, I think it's a great way to get out and, and go see and do some things. So um, if you do, give, give me a call, ping me, um, and we'll work through uh, how to set that up. As so anybody, as, anybody been doing any great modeling? Anybody's uh, <laughs> any new and interesting modeling? Or everybody just been hanging out? Uh, real life has been tying me up. I have not been able to yeah, real get life. to get to my trains that much of, of late. But that hopefully is going to change here in the coming month. Okay, I'll show, I'll show you one thing. This is just a little interesting, interesting little cutie here. Um, this is actually a um, this is actually a carrier to sit on top of a motor, and it's designed for on an O-scale locomotive. I'll pull up a picture in a second. I'll show you how it kind of installed. Um, so this sits on top of a motor right underneath underneath the section here, and then it's designed to hold a decoder. So a little bit of 3D printing. You see the motor sets in there. You can kind of see, and it allows you to run your wiring through the channels and have um, has some guides to guide the uh, wires down. So from an O-scale perspective, we're rebuilding a number of locomotives at the Pleasanton Club. Um, and we're, use, we're reusing a lot of 3D printing to build all the pieces for that, including the frames for the locomotives. So. Well, if I could find the HO drivers, I'd be really interested in locomotive frames. Locomotive frames? Was that what I heard you say there, Ken? Yeah, frames are steam locomotives. Ah. Ah, uh, that's the average. Um, I have a question for the, the group. I'm, I've got four soldering stations uh, set up and tested for the clinic that's coming up. And uh, I'm imagineering, uh, how shall I put it, work boards, four work boards where people could take turns soldering rail joiners rails together with rail joiner, soldering drop wires on, and so on. And uh, 
what other is there does anybody have any specific soldering tasks they would like to have practice on and demonstrations on during the clinic this is all hands on you know, uh, the southern pacific c30-1 caboose ladders are in the mail to me right now ah good good yeah that's something i'm working with with ken uh uh, etched etch work to produce some proper uh, scale ladders for that particular SP caboose, and uh, I'm lending him a hand with that. But for the soldering, um, okay, I just just want to see if anybody came up with something. I, I, you know, I think it might be interesting. I think you know, soldering obviously a, a rail feeder would be an interesting one. Yep. Um, just general electronics soldering, you know, wires and boards. Yeah. Um, coming back to I think what Ken just said. I think the building a building shapes and soldering them with brass, um, you know, um, brass rods, small brass rods, like you know, building a ladder by putting two rods and putting them across, soldering and then cutting them off and doing a little sanding. How you can do that? Those might all be interesting tasks to consider. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to be providing a bunch of this sort of stuff so people can try soldering wires into pads in this case this is a perf board but uh, i'll be having a bunch of those as samples uh, we'll probably also just practice on some copper so we can just see see how uh, the principles of soldering apply i may actually even find some contaminated stuff so we can demonstrate what yeah. happens when you don't have a clean surface yes ken I, I strongly second Phil on on the um, getting a good solder joint between track and and and, and a feeder wire. It's, yes, it's probably the most critical thing for ninety percent of our modelers. Yeah, I'm going to have little, uh, actually like a cardboard box where I've glued on many sections of track with rail joiners, and we'll poke holes through and put drop wires in and solder them on. And just give everybody a chance to just do it. I've got yeah. lots of uh, it, drop it, wire. It, it, it goes in the basic skills that. Yep. Yeah, those techniques will 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 give everybody a chance to uh, do that kind of work. We'll have four stations, and what we'll probably do is, you know, if we have six people, we'll have some doubling up or tripling up, and just sort of take turns. Okay. Next next person try doing this particular thing. I'll do a demo, and then it'll just be everybody tries it, question and answer, hey, why isn't this working? But it's just I need to help people um, get the basic techniques down and a little bit of practice. The skill of applying the technique comes with time, but what I need to do is just get the whys and wheres for us in people's heads and hands. So that's what we'll be covering. I'll have handouts. Uh, based on the, you, I don't know if any of you attended the uh, clinic I did online here in quite a few months ago, and I tried showing people, but uh, the hands-on I think will really be where we'll get some more value for anybody that's interested. So that's that's what I'm working on for the 25th. It's like two separate sets of skills. One is wiring, scattering, control component soldering and the other is like i'm talking with the caboose ladders which is actual model component yeah fabrication and so forth yeah which gets more particular two separate, because almost two separate subjects well the precision like soldering up those etched components to make ladders there you've got to be so clean and precise and stable mm -hmm. in the stuff you're doing that's a, a whole extra level of joy <laughs> Phil, what else we got on the agenda? Yeah, if there's interest, let me let me show this real quick. So this is actually what I was going to show you was these are actually those uh, um, the ah. the frames we're building. So this is a this is for O scale. Um, what what was All Nations was a company that produced a bunch of O scale units. We're actually doing F units. And so this is a 3D printed frame, um, printed frame piece. This is bottom piece is a separate piece. And then these are carriers on the top for the electronics. Um, the frames are pretty cool. If you look at them like 
they're actually designed, these are pockets for those little circuit board LEDs that have mm. the built-in resistor. So these are actually designed, so you just glue one of those in each one of these corners, and now you have inspection lights on all the drives. Um, the other thing we're doing is this is the original, those are for P&D drives, the original All Nations drives. The motors are on lower, and this is actually a stressed frame motor. So if you notice the motor, the frame is actually screwed to either side of the motor. Um, this was kind of an epiphany of the way to do this was to use the way they build F1 cars, where the engine's actually a stressed element of the frame. Mm. And so um, kind of doing some things like that. And then I think I have, if I close that, this is actually the latest version of the frames we're doing. So this is Freak Ad. Um, so they're designed now with, um, these are actually designed for um, speakers to go through, and then there's a piece that goes on the bottom. So that's kind of how you design those frames. So yeah, if there's if there's interest in that at some point, we can do some discussion of that. I, I've not tried to scale it down to HO, but it works pretty well. And it works very good in O scale. We're actually going to have about eight engines that are going to be about 70% of the drive mechanism is all 3D printed. Yeah. Um, you still have to have metal side frames and some other things, but we're printing, we're 3D printing the bolsters. We're 3D printing the frames, all these other pieces to build locomotives out and take advantage of the old, the old, uh, shells, their zinc shells that were built back in the fifties and ah. rebuild those engines. So zinc shells on an O scale. If you drop those on your foot, on your foot, you're going to cripple yourself. They're pretty heavy. Yeah. They're, they're <laughs> pretty, pretty, they were pretty heavy and well built. And, and actually once you get them set up with the drive towers and get them lubricated, right. I mean, some of the engines that were there ran for 15 to 20 years before they wore, we wore out. You know, and that's running probably 20 to 30 days a year. Mm. Bill, what kind of resin are you using to, to get the strength? For, it's just uh, PLA. It's just PLA. Okay. It's not resin. It's filament. It's all filament. Okay. And you get this. The filament gives you good strength. And, and the, the cool thing about it is, hang on, let me share this again. Um, basically, you know, the, the drivers sit here and the shells connect here to these two holes. So it turns out all the weight of the shell is right on the drivers at either end. So the frame across actually doesn't have to carry that. It actually is, um, it, it's really just you know, connected together. Hmm. So yeah, it's been, a, it's, it's been working out pretty well. We have one of our members that's, that's really been very focused on uh, getting engines put together. I, I'm hoping we're doing a show for the good guys this weekend, and he brought in uh, a great northern train that is being powered with these repowered engines. So I'm hoping to have a video of that maybe. Maybe we get together in a couple of weeks. Not, not as exciting as what Fran does. I mean, you can't see it when it's done. <laughs> I, uh, something that I started uh, trying trying to determine whether I want to go whether I want to go down this uh, rabbit hole. Uh, it's a mining locomotive. This is a Baldwin. Um, I forget the year. I I think night around nineteen teens, nineteen fourteen or somewhere. Um, cool. It's a Baldwin with uh, Westinghouse Electric. Uh, it's built for. Uh, gold mining in Alaska, somewhere around Juneau. I forget the name of the town. But, uh, you know, a couple decades later, it came to Santa Cruz Davenport and spent decades there running the, uh, uh, running for the cement mining uh, Pacific Coast aggregates. So, you know, I love the, uh, the look of it. Uh, I'm just not sure I'm going to go there now. And I, I realized it looked, it looked a lot bigger than what it is. This, this height of this up to the top of this cab is from the, from the top of the rail to the top of the cab is really only about six foot. Yeah. So it's going to be a pretty small O scale model. Uh, if I, if I do it in O scale. Um, Fran. Yeah. You're going to take, ugliest motor power award if you enter this anywhere i'm working on it <laughs> that's <laughs> cool 
Yeah, that told, is really cool. We told Fran that this was a great model to do in G, G scale. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's a great model to learn how to use wax 3D, you know, wax based 3D printing with uh, casting to generate the frame. Wow. It's to still, get the math. It, it still uh, exists somewhere in uh, Sacramento's uh, warehouses. They'll, they'll bring it out someday. There were two of them. Um, uh, there were two of them, and then and I think I think at Santa Cruz they eventually ended up with a third. That frame is absolutely massive. It, it, yeah. Except except for it's also small. It looks it looks massive. It is massive for its size. I figure. This, yeah, yeah. This is a uh, for fifteen foot long at the most. I think so. It's massive for the overall size of it, and proportionally. Now, the side frames look to be several inches thick. Oh, oh Aldwin. Yeah. Yeah. Aldwin was building the steam engines, so. Ah. And, and at one point, yeah. the company so we'll see if that, if that actually, uh, yeah. if I go yeah. down there. The most part, right? Didn't somebody call these critters at one point? I would call it a critter. Yeah. Uh, I think Bob Brown called them critters, uh, you know, and Yeah. Well, all the all the locomotives I do are critters. I can't I don't make anything uh bigger than a uh uh four drive wheels. I'll, I'm going to try a six, you know, a, a uh a Bachman six driver mechanism one of these days, but uh my stuff at O scale, it's you know, twenty foot at the at the biggest, and I I call that a critter. It's not something you'll see a big road name on, other than for small switching uh, uh, duties. Yeah, Anybody the, else have something today? Oops, sorry, Fran. Oh, I was just going to say the, the Hercules was in the running for the ugliest, uh, as, as well as that um, uh, so, uh, Colorado locomotive that, uh, that uh, Tom York, I worked on with Tom York, that was looked like it was made from a tender. Uh, combination tender shell and caboose cupola. <laughs> they're, 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 I have a lot of ugly, ugly stuff that someone's got to love. A lot of homemade locomotives. So. Well, cool. Well, that was a, I think we had a great little talk today. Um, we'll plan on two weeks from now. Uh, like I said, if, if anyone's interested in, you know, either talking about some of the projects and programs we have coming up, give me a call. Um, if not, we'll plan on getting together in a couple of weeks. So have a great one, everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and shut her down. Take care, yeah. all. Thanks. Thank you. See you on the 25th, if not in person, if not before. Oh, I've got the SP historical society from the 14th through the uh, 18th ah that's right my one away convention this year there you go <laughs> all right everybody be Bye, well everyone take care okay thanks